Before I begin, I'd like to take this moment to thank and acknowledge my ancestors, my grandparents, and my parents. My master in Capoeirangola, Egeoson da Silva Miranda, o mestre Hoshinyu, as well as all of the masters in Capoeirangola who've come before me, and without whom I wouldn't be uh, in front of you all here today. I'd also like to dedicate this talk to all of the great, amazing kids with whom I work. This one's for you guys. So I'd like to start with some word associations. So I'm going to say a few words, and as I say each word, I want you to think about whether this word is an important trait, behavior, or social skill um, that a young person should have. So let's start with patience, perseverance, respect, obedience, confidence, self-esteem, self -esteem, trust, a sense of belonging, community, punctuality, responsibility, dependability, trustworthiness. So if you've worked with young people before, if you're an educator, or if you've been a young person yourself, which we all have been, it should be beyond the shadow of a doubt for you that all of the words I said are essential behaviors for young people. But as we all know, the world is becoming increasingly competitive and fast-paced, and it makes it it's that much harder for young people to learn these things. Which makes it weird um, for people, I guess, when I start to talk about Caparangola, this very obscure and little-known art from Brazil, but also from Africa, and how this could possibly pass these values on to young people. You know, I can just see, like, people, they get these bewildered expressions when I start to talk about it. But over the years, one of the things I've come to realize is that those looks of like what's going on, um, they come from the fact that people don't know what Caparangola is. And I'm willing to bet that a good number of you listening to me right now watching, you probably have a vague idea of what it is. You might have seen it in a video, in a movie, you might have seen a presentation, maybe you've even gone to a class. But if you humor me just a little bit, as somebody who's been practicing capoeira for over 15 years, I'm just going to give you a really quick uh, history lesson about what Capoeira is. So Capoeira began in the 16th century during the period that we know as the transatlantic slave trade. It was at this time where millions of Africans were forcibly taken from their homes and brought to different parts of the world, in our case Brazil, to act as slave labor for the Portuguese. And so things like Caparangola, movements and practices like these, they were a means by which the enslaved Africans could resist, could resist oppression, colonization, and maintain their connection to their roots, their identities, and their heritage. So, Centuries later, Caparangola, and Capoeira itself rather, is practiced in over 150 countries around the world. It's the single largest exporter of the Portuguese language. And in 2014, it was recognized by UNESCO as an example of the immaterial cultural heritage of humanity. And you know, that, that all sounds really great. But what does this have to do with Filipino children, vulnerable Filipino children, you know, a country in a country that's literally half a world away uh, from Brazil? So actually, that was the question that some friends and I uh, were trying to answer when we founded Project Bantu here in the Philippines, some maybe seven or eight years ago now. And the idea that we had was to use Caparangola as a tool to empower vulnerable young people. This was following what our master had already been doing. To use music and movements to help them learn important life skills and lessons um, that, that we believe would help them become successful. But uh, I suppose before we move on, uh, it would be useful to understand 
who we are talking about when we say vulnerable Filipino kids. You know, who are these children? Um, well, let me introduce you. So these are some of my kids. And, you know, at this point, I could give you some statistics about child poverty in the Philippines or talk about them like they're part of some research paper or an academic study. But here's what I want you to know. Here's what I think you should know about these kids. And it's that they're just amazing, amazing young people. They're talented, they're smart, they're funny, they're gifted at school, they're gifted at sports. Basically, they're just like kids from any other country in the world, from any background, except for one critical life-altering fact. They were born poor. And for many of them, this will mean that from an early age, they've already had to deal with some messed up, hard realities. Things like being abandoned, things like losing a parent, things like being beaten, things like being sexually exploited or abused. You know, and this is why they have trouble with things like staying in school. This is why they have problems with drug addiction. This is why many of them will become parents at an early age. You know, this is why some of them will end up being arrested. Um, and some of them will end up being killed. And it makes me really sad to say all of that, but it's also something that I don't think we can ignore because it's the reality, you know. Here's what the class looks like in San Andres Bukid, where we teach on Saturdays. Cement floor, no chairs, you know, broken pieces of glass on the floor, empty liquor bottles, you know, no electric fan sometimes to speak of, lots and lots of kids crammed into a room and sometimes there's not even any electricity. You know, and when I see this image and I reflect on it, in many ways it's a metaphor for how we and how our society treats kids from these types of backgrounds. They're an afterthought. It's almost as if they don't even matter. So what is it that Kaparangola can offer to these young people? Well, to answer that, I'd like to show you another video, a different one. Um, and I'd like you to watch carefully and to listen carefully to what you're about to see. was an excerpt from a game, or in Kaparangola what we call a jogu, which took place in the context of a hoda or a circle. The hoda is the traditional circle where the game of Kaparangola actually takes place. Now bear in mind, those kids were all from San Andres Bukid, a slum community, one of the most populous areas in the entire city of Manila. The other kids that you saw were from the streets of P. Burgos, you know, the red light district of Makati. Kids from a slum, street kids, they were singing a song in Portuguese. One of them was actually leading the song. Venha ver, venha olhar, 
Vem a ver o angoleiro vadiar. Come look, come see. Come and see the angoleiro play. Now, these kids were playing instruments like the birimbau, the pandeiro, the agogô, the heco heco, and the atabaki. Instruments which many, the majority of Filipinos have never even heard of. And they were playing them well, with skill, and in unison. Now observing the game, the two people who are playing in the middle, the two kids, they were well dressed, they were very clean, they were playing respectfully. If you notice, they were throwing fast kicks at each other and doing these really intricate acrobatic movements. But none of them hit each other by accident or fell over because they were in control the entire time. And from the smiles on their faces, you could tell that they were enjoying themselves by doing something productive, by working together and building together. You know, sometimes we say that capoeira is the only martial art where you're actually smiling and when somebody catches you in an awkward position or maybe, you know, you fall over on the ground, you're still smiling. Capoeira is one of the only ones or perhaps the only one. So how often do we find young people from these types of backgrounds in these situations? It's very rare. The anti-racist educator and activist Azuilda Loreto da Trindade studied several Afro-Brazilian cultural practices in Brazil and she listed a common set of principles that she observed across these cultural manifestations these included samba, capoeira, and many others. And she called these principles the valores civilizatorios afro-brasileiros, or the Afro-Brazilian civilizing values. So to list them, we have orality, ancestrality, memory, corporality, uh, playfulness, cooperation, or co cooperativism, religiosity, circularity, musicality, and finally, vital energy, or what the Afro-Brazilians call Ashe. So what Azuilda discovered was something that experienced players of Capoeira Angola already understood. That those values, those civilizing values, permeate each aspect of our practice. So to help you understand better, I'd like to talk about three, just three of those in the interest of time, right? So I'd like to start with cooperativism or cooperation. So we live in a world that's more and more becoming competitive, which teaches us that it's every man or woman for themselves. Now we enter Capoeira, it's literally an activity that you cannot do alone. It's an activity that requires cooperation. It's an activity that requires that you practice it with others in a community. We see that in the instruments. We see that in the dialogue between the two players who are creating their game in the middle. We see that in the call and response in the singing between the singer and the rest of the people seated in the circle. You know, and for kids, this teaches them to think about other people, you know, that they're not alone, that they're part of a bigger whole, and they have to think about the needs of others. And it teaches them to think about the success of others because only through the success of all do we reach prosperity. Second, I'd like to talk about corporality, which is basically our relationship with our bodies. So this one I think we can all relate to. The world we live in places a premium on physical beauty. It teaches us that whether you're handsome or beautiful or physically attractive, this somehow relates to or equates to your physical, your, your self-worth, your worth in society, how important you are or how irrelevant you are. And now we enter Caparangola, which talks about how we need to respect, to love, to protect and care for every millimeter of our body. In the game of Capoeira it's quite easy to see. It means that to take care of our physical bodies, each time that we are attacked, we have to know how to escape. 
it means that we have to know our body's limits, to adjust to these limits, and to respect them. In Kapwarangola further, there is the notion of the body as a register of memories. That through dance, through our songs, through how we write, through how we paint, and through how we speak, memories and history is preserved, which adds an additional dimension of why we need to respect and take care of our bodies. Lastly, I'd like to talk about the concept of ashe, or as we could call it, vital energy. Ashe teaches us that we are together and that we are all equal. The world that we live in is constantly becoming more fragmented and society just keeps seeming to want to push us further apart and separate us between our age, our gender, our jobs, where we come from, the color of our skin. Ashe teaches us that all things that have life and that exist have vital energy, whether it's the plants, the animals, the rocks, the trees, the water, the air, human beings, all things are sacred and all people are sacred. Despite what they believe, whom they love, what they call themselves, as I said earlier, the color of their skin, how rich they are or how poor they are, what their place in society is, all people are sacred and all people are equal. In Kapwarangola, we see this in the respect that's given to all practitioners, regardless of the aforementioned factors. In Kapwarangola, what matters, what always makes the difference and determines your position is experience. And so, I believe that these civilizing values, combined with dynamic and engaging activities, are what make Capoeira an excellent and effective tool for empowering vulnerable youth. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd like to end with a Nigerian proverb that ma many of you probably have already heard, which says that it takes a community to raise a child. Capoeira Angola, in many ways, can be that community in that it opens a whole new world for vulnerable young people. But more importantly, it makes them part of a supportive community, a community that's interested in empowering them by giving them the right opportunities, the right values, and the right life lessons that are going to help them succeed.